those just tuning in, we're glad you did and understand we had a better audio last week. Hope it's even better tonight so you can tell others, and especially those of you from out of state who, uh, who join us, we're glad that you do. And tonight we're going to cover uh, several, several areas. I won't say they're, they're new, but uh, I believe that uh, they'll be, be insightful for us and uh, to do that, I've got to remember where I put that because that's where I want to try to stick as close as I can to the script that uh, we did today. Oh, by the way, too, on the table, there, there are handouts that go back to September of 2017. None of the handouts are out of date. Uh, they're they're based on on prior studies or books that are available, and uh, so I encourage you, if you don't have them, they're there, and I have no idea how many copies per each, but just feel free to go back there and look and see uh, what what you don't have. Some of you who've been attending probably already have have a file of those, so uh, I just wanted you to be aware of that that we have available. Now I am. Looking, I'm like the blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that's not there. And so that, that uh, is, uh, it's challenging, we'll say it that way. Um, sometimes you really don't know what point in time and place you get this started, but I think our best starting point will be to go where we were last week. And if you have your Bible maps, uh, we're going to be utilizing, we covered two dispensations last week, and I'll put this, this, um, the, this open page of all seven up first, and then we can uh, not necessarily review the in-depth of it, but this, this is, as I shared last week, this was done by a friend of mine, and uh, Leon Bates, in fact, you see his name right here, and you'll see his name on the bottom of that Bible map. But uh, if we can you know, focus on a few things. One, I never dreamed that I would live to see what's taking place in the world today. Never quite understood how a one-world system would come in and so totally control an individual's life until now. You don't have to imagine it. You don't have to wonder how's all this going to happen. Uh, it's reality. We carry on our person the greatest identifier, and that's the cell phone. We have on our license plates identification that can track us from state to state. Uh, there, there are many, many, many ways you can't buy in most of the... A retail outlets without if the computer goes down or the power goes out they can't they can't take your money and so the buying and selling is no longer imaginative you don't have to wonder how can all this happen I mean it can be controlled from one location and then the second thing that I think is even more dramatic if we wonder about whether we're in the latter times because a lot of people especially friends that that just don't want to accept the idea that the Lord could come at any moment, want to say, well, hadn't things always been this way? Well, maybe some things have been like the things we have today, but never, never has so many things been taking place at the same time as we have today. You could take any, just about any, oh, in the situation in life today, from the violence that we have, I think the two, two police officers died. I think one was friendly fire, and that was maybe in New York, and I think there was also another incident that, that a policeman lost his life. Uh, we, we have uh, the situation going on in Washington, and I know that there's some people who have some built-in resistance, uh, especially most of the media. But here, here's something that we need just uh, d d let's talk not common sense but logic can we just take a few minutes and just talk logic let me ask you a couple of questions 
Was there any negative publicity that went out concerning Donald Trump before the election? Almost every news cycle. Everything from Stormy, whatever her name was, the you know, whatever else could be brought up. And yet the man still got elected. He got elected without the support of the majority of the Republicans. In fact, he got elected in spite of some of the leadership in the Republican Party because John McCain was involved in the, in, in, in the whole dossier that they had. And, uh, in fact, his chief of staff met with the, his, the equal parts in the Democratic Party. And, and, and uh, they, they did not, and some of the men still have not accepted. They're never Trumpers, and they're, and they're Republican every day. So if you take the odds, I'm just saying let's talk logic. How could a man without any political background, without any political expertise, never having run for an office, be elected to the presidency of the United States with his track record and the opposition? And I think anybody with any common sense, and I'll use that word, if you statistically you look at it, we have to, I think, conclude that it would have taken a miracle to, to, for it to happen. And so somebody had his hand on it. Now let's talk about the man since he's been in office. His track record wasn't anything to brag on as far as his morality is concerned, multiple marriages, all the other, other, other things he'd been involved in. But the man that got elected has done more to stop abortion. He, he, he removed the executive orders, and there have been some courts fighting it in the appeals to try to, uh, to take away. But uh, we were supporting or financing countries, uh, people outside the U.S. to have abortion. And Trump stopped that. He couldn't fix what we got in, in, in Roe versus Wade here in, in the country until that's changed on the Supreme Court. But he, he took that stand. I've got, I got a file here on the computer because I got selected on this faith leaders meeting that, that we just had. The, the day of the speech that he made, that would have been Monday was a week ago at the UN about the persecution and, and he, he, he really has a concern for the persecution of Christians, and, uh, but all persecution. And then what's taking place in America with uh, the Johnson bill, I forgot the proper name for it, but it's, it's, it's what basically was done back when Lyndon Johnson was, was president, that you as a church, a religious organization, or anything tax exempt, whether it's a college, uh, any organization, you could not be publicly involved in politics. And if so, you could lose your tax exempt status. And, and, and some colleges did. Uh, good, 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 solid Baptist schools lost their tax exempt status because they, did, they didn't bow to it. I don't know many churches, and I think maybe some of the bigger churches where they had TV, uh, you know, exposure, uh, maybe did. But point is, Here's a man who's standing up for religious rights in America. That's not happened since when? And you got to go back a ways. Here's a man that whenever he campaigned, he made some promises. And in these promises he made, one, he said he'd move the embassy back to Jerusalem. And I, I heard him on this, and it was, of course, at Kufi. And those of you who were there heard the embassy move was 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 basically the highlight at Kufi, uh, and the influence Kufi had on getting the embassy moved. But within the inner structure of his cabinet and, and and his staff and office, everybody told him, "Don't touch it. You'll lose. Don't touch it." And he had the meeting, and, and I think maybe, I forgot which one that was in the meeting that um, made the statement that said, and as soon as he had the meeting over with all of his staff and everybody was unanimous and said, don't do it, and when they left the room, he said, we're going to do it. And he did. And the world didn't fall. I mean, there wasn't war. There wasn't even riots. Everything that was so threatening. It wasn't an oil embargo from Saudi Arabia. 
or any other part of the world, but he moved it. And so when it comes to things that should be near and dear to believers, we, we've witnessed it in the last two years. And it doesn't matter what pen you wear. It doesn't matter whether you bow to a donkey or a, a, an elephant. It doesn't matter. It's not, I'm not talking politics. I'm just talking what we know. In the meantime, there is an opposition because isn't it interesting that nearly everything has had the, I mean, everything that's been in opposition, every, all these things that have been brought up, especially since elected from the, the, uh, oh, the Mueller reports and those sort of things, nearly all of it's come from the same source. Now, this so-called whistleblower went through the same channels that everything else got leaked through. And isn't it interesting that every, you know, virtually every news source say the same thing? I mean, they're reading the same script. Uh, you know, it was all, it was all about this, this uh, association with Russia. And in truth, there was an association with Russia. It, 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 it was on the Democratic side. And they paid big money for it. But it seems that this thing's just about to come unraveled. Because they can't contain it. I mean, it's too too much. That Politico, uh, which is a liberal organization, uh, they've they've had to acknowledge, hey, dirt went on in the Ukraine, and and so they're being, you know, some of the reporters may be getting enough courage to get away from the talking points that that are handed down to them, and and, and they're they're researching it and writing it and say, truth is, that uh, we've been going in the wrong direction, and so I'm just saying that to say this. We are living in a time unlike any that we've ever faced before as a nation. And you can go back to 1776. There have been times that we've had scandals and corruption and all kind of things in Washington. But to the extent that it's there now. So those who want to say, and that's the whole point of the, point of the discussion, it's not... It's not to be for or against from that standpoint. It's just to be logical. I mean, how, how can we account for this happening? And then to endure all that's taken place since he's been elected. Now think about this for a moment. How powerful is the FBI? I mean, you just think about it. How powerful is the CIA? Our Central Intelligence Agency. How about the NSA? When they can eavesdrop on everything, anywhere, anytime. Whenever they, 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 they've got all this capability electronically in a, in a computer-driven age. And here's a man who has been placed under the microscope. I mean, they, they knew they've been eavesdropping on the stuff. Because he's had CIA folks in the White House. They know what paper to ask for. And, and so when you stop and, and look at it, and then this coup word comes up. Well, is it a conspiracy? I don't know how you can draw any other conclusion. Uh, that, that, yes, I do believe there are many who would do their very best to put the man out of office. Now, let's ask another question. Why? Why? Well, think about it a little bit. Who's behind it? Now, Paul said the Satan word. But if, if there's going to be a one world system coming about in the tribulation, he no doubt already has some emissaries at work. And whenever you look in your Bible map and you get over here in these early dispensations and on the screen you're seeing, let me, let me just move that to here, you're seeing innocence. And if you, we got plenty of these maps. If you don't have one, make sure you get one. But Adam and Eve started out the Garden of Eden and things were going great. But there was a snake in the garden. And it just happened to be that the snake was the real snake. We know it's Satan, because that's what we'll study in a moment. I, I think I got a handout for you entitled tonight, 
uh, the personality of Satan or person of, of Satan or so forth. It's a front and back one page. Uh, but if you go in Isaiah, 20, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, you're going to see in one of those references that uh, it says that he was in the Garden of Eden. And that means Satan was in the Garden of Eden. And if you, it, did I give them to you, Kent? they in my briefcase then. Yeah, right, right. I thought I pulled them out. I must have given them to Walter. You find it, Walter? Okay. Have you got him a no? Huh? Well, what we need, you can let me know. Okay, I take that. See, if you'd have said something, I'd have given to you. But I think from the time we got in, it took a while to figure out why we couldn't get a signal, and then we did, and we found out we can't run two cables at one time. Okay. Okay, now you got it. Now we're going to do one next on Ezekiel. I think that's Ezekiel 28. I've got Isaiah 14 that, that we'll, we'll put with this. So... The, the purpose, again, if we talk about a, you know, a strategy or a game plan, we have to understand whether you're looking at the Larkin chart and you got Satan's fall back here or whether you're looking over here at the Bible map and in eternity past, it's whenever, whenever Satan did what you're going to study in, uh, in Ezekiel 28. Boy. Now, Follow me just for a moment. Oh, this is Butler Notes. This is a new hero of mine that uh, he, he's so articulate and outlines most of what he, what he uh, publishes. And uh, he, he's just real, real good. And uh, so I think, I think on the bottom of the page he's got the source. But if you think about it, in the Garden of Eden something happened. And the man of sin showed up. And the man of sin tempted Adam and Eve, and sin came into the world. Up until that point, man was living in a time of innocence. And Adam and Eve collectively would have been like Jesus. They would have been sinless. But then that first sin came. And so you can, if you go through the outline that you have in the Bible map, you can see the responsibility, the failure, and the, and the judgment in each of these dispensations. But if we're going to understand prophecy, and this really didn't hit me until I began studying behind Michael Heiser, the unseen world, the supernatural, and so forth, that I had been pretty close to. It wasn't that I denied it. But I kind of had it in the back of my mind, oh, maybe on the same scale that you would mythology. And, 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 and it was just too complicated to take the time to go into a study and, and kind of get a grip on it. So you could even be, you know, you're comfortable with it within your own heart, let alone to be able to teach it. And, and it took me about three years to begin to, and it's about the, the length of a, uh, well, a master's degree is either two to three years. So that's, I mean, that's a major amount of time of study. I can't tell you many hours, but uh, there's relative, it's a few days that I'm not some, either when I go to sleep, when I can't sleep, I got my iPad right by the bed and I had to go buy me a new set of wireless earphones i can't afford the the pods that are apple sales i buy the, the the generic brands and they work just as well and i've got to i'll put one in leave one in the charger and when that one dies i'll take the other one out put it in and 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 connect it and pretty well throughout the night every time i wake up i can go through many of the books i have using the ipad and it's just reading the book to me 
And I try to remember, you know, what did, that didn't, what did I hear I didn't know. And so I'm learning, I really have learned a lot that I didn't know. But anyway, if you look at this, then you get to conscience, that ends with a flood. And then at that time, too, you got the translation of Enoch. I didn't point that out last week. Coming along at the end of this, this time of innocence. And uh, then you can see the, the judgments on your paper. And then, but also, you got the flood. Now, we're going to do the sign of Jonah. Noah, rather, not Jonah, but Noah. Mm, maybe not next week, but the next week. And... Um, to say it's insightful is is bigger than that you can I mean you can say it but to understand it you see Matthew 24 is where you see the terminology of the sign Jesus told his disciples when they asked him about the destruction of Jerusalem and his coming in the end of the age of the world and he he gives you Matthew 24 and 5 but in Matthew 24 you jump down about verse 36 7 8 then you begin to getting into the sign of Noah and what was that sign? Well, I knew it was a flood. But then he says, That's, it's going to be like the days of Noah. What is? When he comes. Now, when's he coming? I believe he's coming in the rapture right here or right here. Not here, but here. The fish up. That is going to be at the end of the, tri uh, at the church age. And then his coming to the earth is going to be at the end of the, millenn uh, at the tribulation, which brings in the millennium which is pictured over here. Now, why is that relevant? Well, we have to understand that the time and times of, of Noah were so bad that God killed every living soul on the earth but the fish. Those that were in the sea survived. Those that were on land perished. We know in that chapter, starting in verses, this is Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2, we know in verse 2 that the sons of God, and that's a capital G, God, you see them again in Job, the first chapter, and there they identified as sons of God who met uh, in this meeting place that Job and God was there and these sons of God and then Lucifer, Satan shows up. And God asked him, where you been? Well, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And this is after Satan and Lucifer's fall. That's another reason I've given you some of the handouts in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. Now, follow me for a moment. We know a little of the character of Satan whether we admit it or not, but he's the deceiver. He's the adversary. That's our enemy. And as soon as God brings up to him, have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan says, oh, yeah, 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 I know Job. So, yeah. You take your hand off of him or take the hedge away from him, as you see in the King James, that's his protection. Take that away from him. And he'll curse you to your face. And God permits it. And Satan had his way. And Job ended up being covered in balls and all kind of means of suffering. Lost his family. Lost his health. No doubt he was an extremely rich man in the first two chapters of Job. You see that. And, and even his wife turned on him. And, and said, you miserable man, well, won't you just curse God and die? Well, if you got a, a wife like, you know, old Job had, that might be not a helpmate, but, but the other. And yet Job never flinched. He said, I know my Redeemer liveth. And so we know the testings of Job. But one of the most important lessons is totally neglected, I think, for the majority in this church age, is what Satan did to him. And the second reality is what God allowed. And so sometimes in life, you know, people have 
the idea that people are sick or they suffer loss because of God's punishment. But that's not Bible. The Bible says God does not reward us according to our iniquity. That's our rebellion. And that he's long-suffering. And you can see it throughout the Psalms. So that's a wrong conclusion, but it's one the devil will put in your mind. And, and uh, you know, it's easier to be judgmental than it is to be understanding. You know, think about that for a bit. Now let's look back at the theme. Now what are we doing? Why are we, why, why are we here? Well, through every dispensation, you can see the evidence of the enemy. And then it all really gets to the tribulation, and does it ever crescendo? Now this is more graphic in the Larkin chart, because here the tribulation is, is, is identified as a time of judgment that's going to come upon the earth. And, and you can see the other details. Satan's cast out at the middle of the tribulation after three and a half years. And then we know at the end of the tribulation, now we know the Lord's coming back, and this is, I mean, it's got to be pre-millennial. He's coming back to set up his kingdom and rule the earth thousand years. I mean, all that Bible is going to be fulfilled. Not a lot of debate there. There's a lot of folks who've got the church way over here coming down when Satan does, middle of the tribulation, three and a half years. But I believe we go up, church age ends, and then you could just take this segment and lift it out and go back and take this dot and connect it over here to this dot at the beginning of the tribulation. Because during the tribulation and during the millennium, we're on the law. Worship on Saturday. Even in, in the millennium, even here, animal sacrifice is going to take place in Jerusalem when Jesus is on the throne. Is that worth knowing? That's Bible. I mean, that's Bible. You start in Ezekiel 40 and go to the end of the chapter. And you can see some interesting things. Even the dimensions of the temple that are given. This is millennium temple and not the, the one that's going to be built uh, during the tribulation. But you, you, you get in the closing chapters of the book of Ezekiel. And you're going to learn about the temple. You're going to learn that the animal sacrifice reinstituted. All these things are happening. And I'm going to be, I don't even know how I took courses on the prophets. Major amount of prophets. We, I mean, I had, and had a good professor doing that. But I do not remember ever, ever having heard a sermon, whether it was a prophecy conference or just regular preaching that identified that in the, in the millennium, that there'd be a river that's going to flow from the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And maybe I can bring you a picture of it next week because I got one, but I don't have it loaded. And it's going to go out of the threshold of the temple. <coughs> a man of olives is going to split, and it will do that when Christ returns, according to the book of Zechariah. And there's going to be a river. It's going to start off, as Ezekiel described it, as ankle deep, and then it gets knee deep, and then it gets waist deep, and, and, and Ezekiel finally said it was so deep you had to swim. And that river's going to divide, and the Mount of Olives have split. And then if you, if you could see the aerial of the Mount of Olives, you look back to your left, there's the Dead Sea. That's Jordan Valley. And then it's going to have, a, it's going to have another fork that's going to go to the Mediterranean. And they're going to catch fresh fish at En Gedi. And we've been to En Gedi. That's where the waterfalls are. And uh, fresh, that's at the Dead Sea. And, and that's going to happen during the millennium. And then you got all the fruit trees that's going to be growing along the banks of this river. And the Lord's on the throne. But what I didn't know, and I, that part I did have a knowledge of, but I never stopped to think that when Christ is on the throne in Jerusalem ruling, and I believe we the bride rule and reign with him, that... Uh, during that time, they would be doing animal sacrifice at the temple. And they'll observe all seven feast days. Never thought about that. 
But it is something we know. If you go on to the closing chapters of Revelation, you're going to get to the, the battle of Gog and Magog. That's not Armageddon. And that's not the Ezekiel 38 Gog and Magog. This battle leads to the destruction of the world by fire, which is pictured here. This is a millennium reign of Christ. This world as we know it is going to be destroyed. And as I talked with you last week about, uh, that's the heavens. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Everywhere Satan's ever been will be cleansed by fire. Everywhere. And then the new, the new Jerusalem is coming down, and the new heaven, new earth is pictured here, and that's Revelation 21, reign and rule with him for all of eternity. That, that Satan's gone, he's bound, he's, it's over. He's in the lake of fire. Now, the thing that we have to kind of maybe have some understanding of, and it, for, at least for me, it helps me. In each of these time periods, and, and you can go from there to human government, and that gets you to the Tower of Babel, that's where it ended, and then you get to the next dispensation's promise, call of Abraham, and, and then you've got the Egyptian captivity uh, that takes place next, and in Exodus, you see the, the uh, call of Moses, and with Moses came the law. That's the Ten Commandments. And then we've got the church age, or the, or, or the time of Christ, law fulfilled in Matthew 27, 50, 50 and 51. That's cross. And then the bare resurrection is ascension to heaven, and then we've got the, the, the church age at Pentecost. And that's the age period we're in. I believe that ends with the rapture. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it would be kind of confusing to have Sunday worshipers and Sabbath worshipers trying to worship at the same time. Because right now, we look at it and say it this way. Messiah hadn't come. Oh, we don't. The Jews do. And we look at it saying, well, they don't know any better because the Messiah hadn't come. But when we begin to see the end times, I believe the church is taken out. On earth is this time where they will become law observant and the sacrifice will be taking place. And with Christ on the throne. And I know that some of you got gotten really long faced with that a little bit. But follow me for a moment. At the battle of Gog and Magog, there's going to be a great deception. He describes it as the sands of the sea. And, and that, that's so many. Oh, wait. And uh, it, I, I'll give you, I got too much happening in front of me to do it on the screen, but I'll give you the text. And then, then we, can, we can just kind of make it a, make it a, a moment to think about and, and just kind of chew on it a bit. But um, we see in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 says this, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9 says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in, 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 in the beloved city. That's Jerusalem. And then you notice what happens next. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And then we see verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night. How long? Forever and ever. Then the great white throne of judgment, which gets a lot of preaching. That starts in verse 11. He says, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Can you imagine that? What does it mean, no place for them? 
know where to stand. I mean, God's already removed the heavens and earth. Know where to stand. Can you imagine what a hopeless feeling that would be whether you're drifting in space or, or, or where that reality takes place? But, you know, we, we like to believe or have hope that there'd be at least something we could hide behind. Oh, Larry, I need to see you before you go. Uh, but anyway, isn't that a lot to think about? So we know, well, the, the, the discussion now is, where do those in verse 8 come from? He says, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sands of the sea. Well, how do you count the sands of the sea? It's like trying to count stars, isn't it? Multitudes. And so if we look at the chart again, and this, you know, we, we, we're trying to put, you know, maybe some mile markers up, but we're, we're now talking at the end of the millennium, and here, this is where the fire comes down. We're over here at, 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 in this time period, and uh, there, there are references to it, but you, you, there's a white throne of judgment coming here. Now think about it for a moment. Who lives through the tribulation? Does anybody? Yes. Matthew 25, he separates the sheep from the goats. And they go into the millennium. They're people that survived the tribulation. They're saved. They're redeemed. And no doubt they marry. And they have children. The children have not known Jesus except as a ruler. They no doubt have heard. But now think of the generations. With Christ on the throne and the lion and the lamb laying down together and all the peace that will be on the earth during the millennium. And I believe with the Lord on the throne, death, uh, there, there's a lot of discussions on whether capital punishment will exist during the millennium while Christ is reigning. Uh, you know, it's not to say that it won't. A man could be that rebellious because Satan was. And he was in heaven, not on earth. But they, lead, they, they have their children. But in a thousand years, if Christ is on the throne and, and health isn't an issue, would it be possible to live that entire thousand years and never die? I think that's logical. Because it'd have to be a purpose for death. You see, when Christ is on the throne, the curse of sin is basically lifted. Hence, the lion and the lamb laying down together. Because I, I, I believe during the, during the time in the Garden of Eden that Adam may have had a, he might have had a pet lion. You know, I think the ferociousness in the animal kingdom really surfaced during the uh, time of sin, after Adam sinned. It's where all the land began to produce briars. Man had to earn his, his living by the sweat of his brow. Uh, babies were born. The childbirth was with pain. And I believe during the millennium that that curse is lifted while the Lord's reigning there in Jerusalem. But the power of deception is one interesting. We say, well, how could these be deceived during the millennium with Christ on the throne? And I do believe that, uh, you know, travel's going to be <laughs> maybe uh, at thought. And I know it will for saints, the glorified. But you gotta, you got to weigh it with something. you got to have a balance and a counterbalance. How can we compare this thought? How do we understand what happens to the children that are born during this period of time that they're going to believe the lie of Satan when he's loosed? Or whenever you look at it, you look at it over here. Oh, you know, what happens? Well, that's not hard to figure out. You see it in Ezekiel 28. You see it in Isaiah 14. Satan was in heaven when he sinned. 
He was a covering cherub. He was, he, he, he was over the Holy of Holies. Meaning he, he was as close to God as you could be. And, and, and not be in the Trinity. And it was there he sinned. And so it should lead us to have a little glimpse, if not, if not a broad view, of the power of temptation. Now what does he tempt them with? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what he could promise. These children born during the millennium who would go against their parents, go against those who'd say, you don't need to do that. Jesus is the Messiah. But Satan did it and led a third of the angels in his rebellion. And that's why there's no plan of redemption for them. You see it in Jude. We've not done the Jude study yet, but we've got to tie it in. We do fallen angels. And uh, that, that's in the complement of our study on Lucifer. But I believe today we're blind, blind to the power of temptation. I believe that's why in the Lord's Prayer, he taught us how to pray. Our Father... Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This was our Jubilee theme last year. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. That's in my life and yours. May, you know, my will be done on earth as it is in the heaven. And lead us not into what? Temptation. It wasn't the first thing. The first thing he put in that Lord's Prayer was, that we are to pray about his kingdom coming. That phrase arrested me. That's one of the reasons I, I get got on my mind. I can get over. We used it for Jubilee last year. I mean, we, we address him. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Next word. Thy kingdom come. And, and, and that kingdom is twofold. It's going to be during, during the millennium following the tribulation. It's again pictured here. But also we got the new heaven, new earth. Now, that's not illustrated here. Well, it's referenced here. But we got the new heaven. We got the new earth, new Jerusalem coming down out of God, out of heaven. And that's our eternal abode. Be there forever. And so, as we look at these dispensations, I hope that you just won't take this and, uh, and do with it as we heard Sunday. And, and I'm so thankful for the day God gave us with every man's award in cultivating holy beauty, hearing from the lay of our church. And, uh, but uh, maybe King did a lot of cutting up, but he also made mention that when he got behind, he tried to catch up. But then he realized that it was fixed in, in the diary, in the scripture, and so forth to, uh, to, 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 to encourage you to stay up and don't wait you get behind. But this isn't something we're crammed for. And so many people said that they've done quiet times and like to check the box and say, I've got this done. And then they begin to see what's the real truth. Don't check off that you know what the millennium is. Don't check off that you know what the time of innocence is. Look at it. And then try to live with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Try to live during that time of conscience when they came out of the Garden of Eden. And you can do that reading the first five chapters of Genesis. And then you can get with Noah when you get in chapter 6. And you see that the sons of God saw the daughters of men had lust for them, took them as wives. That's when the, the, they were kicked out of heaven. That was their, their sin. Because I believe they knew the plan of salvation. I believe they knew that if they did this thing, and lust drove it, if they did this thing, that there's no going back. There's no going back. The door was closed. And yet they did it anyway. And so as we look at it, maybe the, the best word I know to, to, to bounce now is there should be a soberness. You know, we, we, we should be sober about this and say, you know, if Adam living in a perfect place with perfect conditions even God giving him the perfect wife. And they messed up. 
Do I need to be careful? Desperately so. And I'm afraid in the modern day, it's not on most people's minds. I, I don't even think people factor it in. Uh, their worship time often is what can I, you know, what can I make room for uh, my worship this week? And in reality, our week should be a worship, a, a week of worship that we make room to do what we have to do. But our, our walk with God should be, should be the only thing that's on our mind when we get up and we go to sleep. And then that longing we'd have, I want to see him. I want to see him. I want to hear his voice, feel his touch. Can't imagine the joy that will flood our souls when we hear well done thy good and faithful servant welcome now sometimes we get a little advance notice John Stackhouse who lived less than a month had notice never lost his faculties knew exactly what was going on that's that's um, a blessing but Walter, may I ask you a question? How old were you when you had your stroke? Huh? 50. And uh, when you had the stroke, were you ready to meet God? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? See, Walter got no notice. None. None. Sometimes people get a notice. And we get that notice. That's preparation time. There's no excuse for a person dying without making preparation when they know they're going to die. I don't care how strong denial is when you know you're going to die. But what we all ought to do is to make preparation as if we were, if we were to die tonight. Then to be well with our soul. I think and believe when we do, we're free. We're free. Satan doesn't have it. He doesn't have leverage. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't have a toehold. He doesn't have, he doesn't have any, anything he can hold over us to make us put it off. Because we understand reality. We know absent the body present with the Lord. And, and, and we know it's instantaneous. And so that's the challenge we have. And then you can... You, you can go all the way through the map. I, did, I just wanted to use this for a moment to show you that in every dispensation, getting all the way to here. Now, from here, after the rapture, Jesus sets up his kingdom. And then all the way to here, Satan's not in the picture during this thousand years. He is bound. But at the end of the thousand years, as we read a moment ago, he, he's released. And when he comes back, he's back up to the same old game. But he also, I believe, knows that's his final. See, he's already been condemned. He's awaiting execution. His execution doesn't happen until you get to the end of the uh, millennium. And that's where we saw his place. We just read it a bit ago, to the lake of fire. And, and, and so when we look at this... <sighs> I believe it this way, and it's been, it's been kind of my, my testimony and my experience. I don't know anything in my Christian walk that helps me any more than the realization that the Lord could rapture me at any time. There's no time button on the rapture. But also I know that he could take me at any time. I don't have the certainty of a tomorrow. But in his hands, I trust him. And that's peace. And so my study of prophecy helps me have a prepared heart. And heaven's a prepared place. And, and so it, it really... Back in the day, now in the 70s, and some of you are around long, back then enough to know, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, the young generation doesn't. If you were in church in the 70s, 
Uh, there were a lot of revivals going on in the 70s, primarily because people were anticipating the rapture. I mean, the wars going on in Vietnam, we had civil unrest, all the riots in the major cities, all these things were going on, and the young people decided it was time for them to, to, to break tradition and, and, and live the hippie life and, and, and the, what was called the free love, uh, new morality, uh, no marriage, didn't have to marry and uh, just cohabitate, do what you want to do. It was a drug-fed day. How much of that is today? Are we living in a day where drugs are... I think drugs are more of an epidemic today than they were back in the 70s. And then, you know, you know all the other stuff that's going on, it's, it's mind-boggling. Okay, so I just wanted to, to, to uh, start you there, and then we're going to change gears if I can have the cooperation and to do that I think I didn't do I didn't do I want to do I want I tell you what let's do let's do let's do I think I got to print some more before the foundation of the world I didn't I didn't do that yet let's go up here I think I can make this fit the screen without having to change a lot of stuff. I, I shared a part of this last week, but I didn't, I didn't give you a lot of it. And I think, I, don't you have a printout and title, uh, Prophecy Outline or Signs of the Latter Days? All right, if you look at, th this was, this was kind of my intro years and years ago I said that. Uh, it, it helps break it down for me. And I want to just spend a little time on sign one. We did some of it in the intro before we got started. And uh, I, I think that as we look at this, you, you'll see uh, the relevance of it. But uh, do we need signs? I showed you a little clip, and I, I've got one that's a lot shorter. And, and it was done by the BBC, about three minutes, on that um, La Palma islands and, and the volcano there that could erupt and the tidal waves that would ensue. Uh, it, once it does, you've got problems in Yellowstone. That's, you've got clusters of earthquakes taking place throughout the Midwest. Uh, we, we've got uh, the hurricanes that we've had here on the East Coast and certainly the one that hit uh, the Bahamas and Abaco was just, just unimaginable to, to churn up that much velocity of wind and sit there for 48 hours it's just unimaginable what those people had to go through and uh, a a as we think about some things but can we not conclude there's signs in nature and then you got snow where is it Arizona up the mountains Rockies I think got a foot of snow or two feet of snow and and, and uh, here hadn't even got fall yet and then you got signs of immorality. You see this in 2 Timothy 3. You look at those verses. I didn't print them out for you. But we got the signs of immorality. I mean, that's going back to the 70s. We talked a lot about this. And I think some of the old church fathers, uh, like, uh, well, if you go all the way back to the turn of the century, uh, when the 20s came in with the flappers, and then you had all that took place during Prohibition with the with the gangs and Al Capone and, and, and so many others, uh, reading uh, Dr. Ironside, I and especially enjoy reading his, his um, uh, materials, that he, he, looked, he looked for the day that we now live in. He talked about Israel becoming a nation, and, and I think Ironside died about 1950, one, two, or three, and Israel became a nation, in, uh, you know, back in, 48 and 67 Jerusalem but the, uh, these signs I, I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time talking about those but but I, I believe they're there the most uh, interesting is that third sign signs of apostasy second Peter 3 uh, it describes the false prophets and teachers and and in the day that we live uh, I got something interesting that maybe some of you saw this was done by uh, prophecy news watch and uh, this is an article that's entitled u.s expert no u.n expert expert calls for action against religious 
are religions that don't embrace the LGBT rights. And uh, then I did see the, the article today uh, over at Christ United, and uh, they were interviewing uh, Pastor Dunn, and he's pulling out of the Methodist Church because of their position on, on, on the issue, but, uh, and then they've taken the property, or probably end up in court, but I think they gave them like a day to move. And uh, so we're in a time where, uh, and, and what is going to say for, for a lost sight of it? I hope you understand that much of this that's being enforced, like at the UN, are coming from clergy. They're the ones leading it. You see a layman, or not even a layman, just a politician who would make these sort of stand. He, he doesn't have clout. But you get the doctor up there with that many degrees, and, and he has got some rep reputation that uh, he, he, they look at him and say, he must know what he's talking about. And when it comes to religion... And, and so they want to put that face before the public. But then at the same time, they want to minimize any opposition. They have no tolerance. Uh, you've noticed that through the media. Uh, if there's a debate going on, well, you can, you can see who's getting talked down by the, the people doing the interviewing. They got their script. And, and, and they want you to go by the script even though the script's a lie. And somebody tries to say, no, that's not what happened. He, they won't let them talk. And, and the same thing is true. You can't debate certain subjects. Uh, you go to, to go to some of the little colleges, and if you've got an opposing view to, I'll give you one, to the weather change, climate change, uh, they, they, won't give you, they won't give you an audience. Or if you have a persuasive argument, they'll have enough students protest your being there that you don't get to speak. So you, got no, you don't have the freedom of speech. Uh, that that's limited today. Uh, so if, if we stop and think about apostasy, and in most cases, you got a clergy person or a clergy background behind the people leading all these protests. And uh, I mean, it goes all the way through. Doesn't matter what it is. It can be on abortion. It can be on nearly any subject. They got one. So not only do we have apostasy within our communities, we got apostasy in our pulpits. And the apostasy in the pulpits is doing, has done the damage now for years when you take away the Bible as a sole authority. You see, you have to attack God's Word. If you say, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, Genesis, Revelation, truth without any mixture, error, and, and then you've got what the Scriptures has to say about this, about this issue. And that's what Dunn was saying. I mean, you, you, you can't be a Bible believer advocate your belief in it without making a stand. And, and so the LGBT crowd, if you, if you see the in Scripture that contradicts what they believe, uh, it doesn't matter about what you believe. And, and so we're living in a day of apostasy. Uh, when I began years ago, there were a few, uh, even a few Baptists who didn't believe in the virgin birth or the bodily resurrection, but they were a minority. Today, the majority would side with them based on science. And they'll say things like, well, I, I just don't see how biologically you could have a virgin birth. Well, they're saying, I can't, I can't see God. And truth is, Adam got here without a mom or a daddy. God just created and breathed life into him. And, and, and Eve got here through a rib. So, you know, the, 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 the logic of their arguments are so limited is almost a one statement. So we're in a day of apostasy. And then the signs in, in the church. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we see uh, a falling away, but uh, I, I believe what we're, I, I think two things have happened. I think people who have real conviction, real Bible convictions, they don't move. I mean, that was proven in the Middle East, in the Christian churches, when ISIS came into town. 
and they did not deny their faith and some lost their heads because it wasn't a fad, it wasn't a club, it wasn't something that they had joined uh, in a feel-good moment. It was their belief. And, and I don't know how you can be saved. And I mean, knowing Jesus as your Savior, heaven is your home without faith. I mean, faith. And, and, and so that was proven in the first century. The church flourished during the time of the persecutions in Rome when they were being fed to lions, burned at the stake, crucified, beheaded. Uh, all the things that happened in the first century have happened in our century. And especially in the Middle East. Africa, every weekend, Christians die in Africa. Every weekend. It's like open season. And uh, as I said last week or the week before, they like to, to nail the doors of the church closed and set it on fire. And, and uh, just burn the people up in the church. That's one of their favorite things. And that would be intimidating. But we also have those that are like those Christians. They know it when they go in there. They know when they go in. And whether it's in Iran, whether it's in, in other areas of the Middle East, uh, in other countries, as in Africa, when they know. Um, in Micronesia, you, you get over... Uh, the, the, the Muslim population is greater over in the, you know, in the, in the, in the Orient than it is over here and uh, stronger. But uh, they know when they go to worship that while they're there, the church could be surrounded and, and it might be their last day. But they don't stop. And they're excited about Jesus. So, you know, worship does take a, a, a whole me new meaning. And then I believe the next event is the rapture. I believe the church is going to bring the, uh, the church age is going to come to a close with the rapture in the three terms. And it's caught up. We shall be changed and come up here. Revelation 4, 1 through 3 is where I see three events that depict the rapture. And uh, the uh, rapture, obviously, as we've touched on it already at the end of the church age, which is over here. And then uh, the Bible map I don't have up. So that, that, that part we need to have some, some understanding of. Now, immediately following the rapture, there's something going to happen. And this doesn't get a lot of attention. And uh, we, need to, we need to take the time to do it. And that is that believers appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And there's a purpose for that. And now we know, we know that all believers will appear before the judgment seat. Now that's going to happen. Now when? I believe it's uh, following the rapture uh, in both ways I do. And here uh, we, we see it, we see the scripture, and I got to shrink that a little bit for you to see the whole, the whole whoa, 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 here, whoa, right here. All right, Romans 14 and verse 10. And then according to that he hath done, 2 Corinthians 5:10. Uh, th these are two things that we need to focus on. We shall all appear before the judgment seat, and then according to that we have done. So God's going to review our life. And, and, and there'll be crowns. They'll, the, we, we'll have rewards uh, because of our faithfulness. It's not a, it's not a work salvation. It, it's just, and we've got the scripture. I don't know if I ever give that to you. If I didn't, I'll have to do it. Maybe next week I'm bringing you the five crown verses so that you can see those. And uh, maybe help, help you there with, with what happens at the judgment seat. I believe we leave the judgment seat to go to our role in the millennium. I think based on our life after it's judged, and, and uh, we see in Romans 14.10 and 2 Corinthians 5.10, I believe it's when we appear to him from there is where I think we get our assignment in the millennium as to what we'll do. And then I think that also will serve in the New Jerusalem uh, in eternity. So the idea that some people have that it's not profitable to worship God, they don't understand what the future is because we're building towards the future. And so here in, in uh, this text, we've got a great, uh, well, we got a good sermon outline, and I'm going to go back and recap that again in a moment. Look, look with me uh, just a bit further from... I believe from the marriage, uh, uh, from the judgment seat, we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that is depicted 
maybe here. I can't see it. Right, right in here you have, there's the rewards uh, there. And I think those crowns, if you got a chart, you'll see the crowns. But then the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we return with him uh, to the earth during the millennium. Now, at the marriage supper, we see it in Revelation 19.7. It said, let us be glad and rejoice. And then in Revelation, and i got to move that just a bit. Revelation 19.9. And I'll be able to put this back at where you can at least see it. Okay. Now, what happens next? Well, you got tribulation. And there's where we reign with him. You got all the judgments. I mentioned those uh, before. Then Armageddon. And then we go on to new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Now, is it complicated? I don't think so. For this reason. If you, if you look at what we've gone over just right here. And uh, we could do the same thing with the with the maps but uh, follow me for a bit signs of the latter days there's four I mentioned you could put in probably 50 but uh, in any of these four talking points from nature to a time of immorality that might be the most awkward to get a conversation with depending on who signs of apostasy that's falling away and then signs of, in, in the church. Uh, here, you can almost get a conversation going on any one of these four. People will talk to you about it. They'll, you can say, what do you think about this? Why, why do you suppose people uh, are, are becoming uh, less committed in, in the day we live? Well, one, it, it's, it's what's predicted in Scripture. You read it, and uh, you can see it in Peter, and you also see it in Jude, that 18th verse. Uh, it, it's there. These are good icebreakers. These are good you know, points to have conversation with. And then when it comes to the rapture, I think most people rebel at the idea of the rapture and don't really look at the content of the event. They don't, they don't understand it will be snatched up. I use caught up here, but it, it really in the Greek means snatched up. And then it will all be changed. Now, I don't know of anybody that couldn't have a conversation with some of our senior citizens uh, over we shall be changed. Uh, I, I think people have a certain level of, of, of maybe resentment or resistance, be a better word. Uh, I hear a lot of folks who've said, well, I want to see my grandkids grow up. I can understand that. Grow up to do what? Think about it. If the crime rate continues to go up, grow up, is there a probability that you could have a loved one that could be the victim of a crime? How about disease? As these epidemics that are being forecast will one day take hold, smallpox being one, they're saying smallpox maybe will knock out 100 million people. Because the, vaccina the vaccination you and I got in were flipping, the younger generation never had one. So if a smallpox thing breaks out, we all going to die. They don't have the vaccine, number one. You'd have to vaccinate the whole world, uh, you know, to try to prevent that. So grow up to do what? Uh, you know, people have empty thoughts. Uh, then, you know, the reality, they could grow up to reject Christ. They could grow up to, to do any number of things. And, uh, but I don't, I don't think the average person thinks that far down the road. You know, you're not penalized in the rapture. It, it's almost like it's a judgment in the minds of many. I want to live my life. Yeah, I did too when I was 21, 31, 41, 51. But now that I'm a little further up the road... And all these Idis brothers have made visits to me. And, and I can understand that the odds are, I remember when I first saw the statistics, 
that said if you live long enough as a man, you will have prostate cancer. And it wasn't but a few years after I read that statistic that I was one. And, and so, you know, these things are, are out there. Uh, this kind of interesting. I had a lab appointment week before last to do my blood work. I got all ready, did the thing all the way up to midnight. I had an 840 appointment, I think. I go to bed. At 3, 3 o'clock, I believe, I woke up. I was soaking wet. And I'm thinking, what did I do? Have I got a fever? Well, when I got up, I realized what was going on. My sugar had dropped. And I didn't, I mean, I got, and it dropped so hard and quick on me, I didn't even go check it. I just began grabbing Snickers and whatever else to, to bounce back. And so I could not do the lab because I had to eat. Well, that appointment was rescheduled for this morning. Well, at midnight. Now, yesterday, well, I got too hot last Thursday, and, and it's still taking me a while to catch back because I, I just got dehydrated. And, and hydration is not something you can do overnight unless you go get some IVs and, and get it back. So uh, Sunday was a packed day. I didn't drink. And uh, because, and then Saturday was, well, Saturday was too. I had a board meeting with Frontier Baptist Missions that was over uh, conference calls. And uh, then the funeral uh, for uh, John and uh, prep time and getting ready for, for Sunday and all this. So I had two or three days that was kind of mashed together. And, uh, but anyway, at uh, midnight, la I went to bed early la uh, la last night. I got to bed about uh, maybe before nine, and uh, but at midnight I woke up, I was in the sweats, and I'm thinking I'm not supposed to eat after midnight, but it's 12:36. So I have learned to do. I get these these uh, slim fast um, drink breakfasts, and so that's my, that's a, that's, a, that's better than the Snickers. So I go and I, I drink one of those, thinking we'll buy. The, the, and they moved my appointment up this morning until, what time was it, 7? Oh, 8 o'clock, I guess. And so I, I'm good. Well, I didn't do anything. I didn't even, I, don't, I didn't even check my sugar. But this morning at 5.30, now that's after drinking the Slim Fast, at 5.30, I was in the sweats again. Well, I got up. Well, I had to cut the light on to do my checks. And when I get spots that get in front of my eyes, it's either dehydration or sugar. Well, when I checked my sugar this morning at 5.30, it was 54. And I may have gotten to 40 before, but that's close to a crash. I mean, that's, that's you know, you, you're not functioning real well. So then I had to do something. So I drank another Slim Fast. But I knew I couldn't go to the doctor. So they, they got me scheduled again tomorrow morning at 740. So pray. And, and what's interesting, I've not had a crash at night. I mean, this is, this is so out of the norm, <laughs> you know, for, for it to happen. But anyway, i got to do that. So this getting old is what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, to know one day when I get my new body, I won't be having to prick my finger. I won't be having to, to, to do all these things. And, and uh, so that should help us all have levels of encouragement. But that little outline that, that you've got, those few points, that I've been using, I had uh, a, a Piedmont Bible College professor uh, was good on prophecy, and he spoke, I went to hear him, and he gave that outline. And it has helped me over the years. That was, that was my primer. That's how I got started. Because it helped me kind of see things as you see them on the chart, and on the Bible map, but you kind of get an idea where these things all fit. And it, it's a skeleton. It's not an extensive, in-depth study, but it should be enough to give you some Bible so that you can, one, even have a conversation because they're signs of the end times. Most of us know them before we even begin reading about them and studying them. And so tonight's uh, theme has been one, we need to understand the adversary. 
and that he's been in every generation going all the way back to Adam. Every generation. That's why we see in Scripture that we're, we're, he was tempted in all points as we are. But there's no temptation taken you, but it's common to man. We all have temptation. And we all have to deal with temptation. We all have to overcome the temptation. And, and so we can't, you know, we can't say because of, uh, well, one I used to use a lot. And I think I was sharing this with Pam or somebody the other day. Uh, but uh, I've had people who have told me sincerely believing it, that they, they had a bad temper because they were redheaded. Redheaded. And so I can't help it, I'm redheaded. And maybe they were told that as a child, I don't know. But no, all of us face temptation. None of us can say, I was tempted above anybody else. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter how bad the circumstances were. No one has ever suffered like our Savior. Because he was tempted in all points. And he was tempted with everything the devil could throw at him. And he never sinned. And so if we understand, and let me say this too, there's a lot of stuff going on about Mary Magdalene and others about, about Jesus being married to her and they had children and so forth. Uh, that's insane. Either Jesus is the only begotten Son of God without one blemish, without one spot. He had to be born of a virgin and he had to live a sinless life. He had to do that to be our Savior. And besides that, because he is a son of God, he could not die. And those who would seek to find his body, when I say die, I mean stay dead. Those who seek to find a body and say this is a skeleton, this is where they had this box in Jerusalem a while back that they found and they wanted to say that it was Jesus' burial. And no, no. If, he, if he's buried, we have no hope. Because it's the resurrection that sealed our place in heaven. And so we, 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 have, to, we have to issue. You know, it's amazing. If we put a little logic, as I talked about earlier, put a little common sense of what we see in Scripture, then we can begin to see how it fits. I'm trying to give you things to show you where they fit. Satan has been around all the way from before the beginning. And that's whenever he led to rebellion. And he's been in every dispensation. He is a constant in every man's life. And uh, toward the end, before we close, we're going to do, do a, a lesson. Uh, or may, might, I don't think get two in the semester, but may move it to Wednesday night because uh, I'm going to do the, the spiritual warfare. We, we, have to, we have to identify it. We have to understand there is spiritual warfare. We have to understand that we have armor. We have equipment. God has given it to us. And we have to most of all know that we got authority. And authority unused is defeat. God gave us authority. And, and, and if we don't use it, we'll suffer. And our family members will suffer. Because we didn't. Because what's happening... The demons who don't have authority are driving life as we know it in the wrong direction. And I believe that's one of the reasons we get all stuff we do this wrong. Okay, now, I don't have time to do another topic, but let's see. Do anybody got a question? No, we, didn't, we didn't do that last week. Yes, ma'am. Well, it is not something that Baptists are programmed to even consider. But he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And uh, the test in the Old Testament was a test of, of uh, really obedience. 
But I, I, I was in a study, and it's interesting you ask, that has impressed me. And I'm not even, I don't even know if I'm at the point where I can really discuss it. But the keeping of the law never offered any forgiveness. We think so. Because most people, when we veer and maybe suffer some consequence, then Satan beats us up saying, well, you deserved it. You're not right. You know, repent. And the repentance is that you, you, you change from what you're doing. But it's all about the blood. See, Christ forgave our sins past, present, and future. So he doesn't hold our sins against us. But what, what the law did was to help us recognize our unrighteousness. It, it, it cut the light on it. Whenever we go through the ten, whether we go through whatever we go through in Scripture and we get conviction, that conviction is not a salvation issue. That conviction is a cleansing issue. So what will wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. Now, when do we apply the blood? It's going to be during some type of worship. Either we do it in our private worship, or we do it in public worship. But it's when we worship him, it's out of a heart of worship that our sins are forgiven. It's not out of any order or legalism or believing I've got to do this. But for too many, the law really has fueled this idea of legalism that engulfs a lot of, a lot of Baptists, a lot of people. And I'll be honest, as a, as a preacher, when... I first got involved in the ministry. The most comfortable I have ever been in ministry was when I had the most rules. I had a rule for everything. And so I didn't have to make decisions. And that was from the length of a man's hair to whether a woman wore a skirt or a pair of pants or uh, where you went for worldly amusement, whether it was a theater or a deck of cards. Uh, or, or whatever else you did. And I think the same thing is true, not just of me as a pastor, but it was sadly true of me as a father. That if I could make enough rules, I could force it on my kids. And God gave all of us a free will. And more than anything else, God says these three words or two. I'm going to say it this way with three. You can trust. And that's for me. And we commit our kids, our ministry, and what we do to God. And we give it to him. And then get out of the way. And let God be God. And we're just obedient. We have a victory. But to say why he's doing that, the Passover, which I do believe they will observe, they will understand Jesus was a Passover lamb. But I think the better equation is going to be, because he's a type of what will be done, everything about the worship that they had pointed to his coming. And But I, I think that one of the keys that, that was hard for me to grasp at first, that whenever we, uh, when we worship him, that... Uh, we worship him. Uh, you know, we, we can find comfort in a lot of things. I'll give an example. Maybe maybe this will work and maybe it won't, but it comes to mind. I've had people who have said to me, I come to church because I'm afraid not to. I'm afraid if I don't, something bad will happen to me. God didn't do that. No, we should come to church because Jesus is here in the body. And we have a role in the body. And we don't know who might need to be prayed over. We don't know, you know, what the body needs to do. Because I believe when the body of Christ is in one accord and, and we're functioning according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, all of, all of Jesus is here. I, yes, sir.
<laughs> you should, Walter. Walter making a point for those mighty hearing about the virgin birth and since God's God and he's a creator. Well, I think that's another one of those things that this study I'm doing that we're going to we're going to get to. I've given you this handout tonight as we go into and look at a closer view of we, we, we've we've found the devil in every one of these dispensations. We know he was there. What we're going to begin to do is look for motive and we look for motive. I think we're going to see that, that, that there is a likeness in the Lord's. You, you can see the temptation of Christ. Whenever he was after his baptism. And you take the three temptations. You can take those same three temptations and you can examine that in the Garden of Eden. You can hear what he told Mary, not Mary, Eve, and, and the temptation of Adam. You'll be smart like God. You know, you, 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 he offered Jesus the whole world. Uh, there's a parallel, and I think basically all of our temptations will revolve around the three Jesus faced uh, whenever he was tempted in the wilderness those 40 days. It, it, it'll, be, it'll, it'll be a type that you can see and tie it back to one of those three. And so to not only understand Satan was around, knowing Satan is around and will be until the end of the millennium, he'll be bound a thousand, but then he'll be in the lake of fire. Once he's gone, he's gone. But up until then, to know, he, to know, who, know he's around is one thing. To have a better understanding of his tactics is something else. To know how he's working. And then we realize how we're thinking. And we say, where did I get that thought? And where would that thought come from? And, and so we, we then begin to see. Uh, and I believe that's where we grow spiritually. I think that's where we... And that's the benefit. If there's a burden I have in teaching what we're doing now, it's not so much to give you a head knowledge of when all these things happen. It's how do we apply it in our life? You know, what can I take from this study tonight? Look at these Bible verses and see how I can, that, that's useful for me. First, for my own spiritual growth. You know, for, for, for my own edification. And then secondly, that that may be seen by others in me. And that we could, you know, you, and when people get on the same team, and I'm going to close with this. Walter, I don't believe you will mind my doing this. When you had your stroke, and then you were obviously immediately affected on your, what, left side? And um, you see, Walter is as whole in front of us now as he was before the stroke. Now, Walter had a stroke that impaired not his whole body, but indirectly it did. But it has given him paralysis on his left side. Did, you, did, did, did it hit the facial? Did you have tongue numbness on it? It wore off. Okay. Now, look, listen for a moment. Jesus is the head of the church. It was in Walter's head that he had the stroke. That, that's where the nerve centers are. And that's why the damage that Walter suffered affected his body as it did. Now, Walter is as much here now as he would have been then, before the stroke, with this consideration. If Jesus is ahead and I make up his body, the head tells the hand what to do. The head tells the feet what to do. The head speaks to my heart and keeps it going because that stroke could have hit an area in Walter's brain that affected vital organs and he could have died instantly. Have you ever stopped to think if we're the body of Christ and every time Grand Strand Baptist Church meets, are we a healthy body, functioning body? Or do we have some paralysis? If all the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 are in the body, and healing is one of them, and miracles is one of them, and the Bible says God's put his gift in the body as it pleased him, not us, but as it pleased him, 
Do you suppose we're missing something if our body is not healthy? Do you suppose it's affecting all of us if, if some of the body decides, well, I'm not going to go to church Sunday. I'm going to go fishing or I'm going to go do what I want to do. And on that particular Sunday, we needed to see the miraculous power of God displayed. You see, if, if the stroke that Walter suffered were reversed, his body would be sound. If we can reverse the damage that Satan's doing, and not just our church, it's all the way across Christ, the, the Christian kingdom where week after week we meet and our problems are most who are in the church and in the body, too many have the attitude, it's all about me. I mean, they want the special music they like. They want the length of the service to be in their comfort zone. They don't want it too loud. They want, they, they want the person sitting on their pew that they like. So today, modern worship is all about me. When it ought to be all about those that come the first time. People don't think, I've heard that sermon before, but you might not stop long enough to realize the man that came last Sunday never heard it before, and he got saved. But see, we're so, we're so picky, you know, grady. about We don't stop long enough to say, God, what are you doing this morning? You know, well, why did you lay that song on Brother Cleve's heart? And he said, it's not even my style. I don't even like that song. And you fail to realize that the one who really needed to hear it did. And he wasn't in the kingdom, but it opened the door. It's got to be beyond us. Got to be. And I guarantee you, and I hadn't heard the but I know the service went long Sunday. And I guarantee you there's some people who, who had stewed preacher all the way home. And, and, and you're trying to say, well, you know, why, what's wrong with him? But I know who, who's in control. And you could not have scripted last Sunday. You could not have. And that excites me. So, I don't know why I got hiccups. It's time to go. 33, three minutes over, pray. Lord bless us, now help us. Thank you for what you've done. And Lord, may we see life from your perspective and realize how much we need you. How much we need your anointing. How much we need your walk. How much we need to dedicate more of ourselves to you. Lord, may the work begin in my heart. Lord, help us. Help us get a, just a glimpse of glory and, and, and realizing one day one day we will see you in glory and, and go to our new home help us now in Christ's name we pray